Sechas Yivam Mestaf Ayin Ches continues Gemara's discussion of a mitzris and a mitzri and their halachos when they're allowed to come bikahal. The Gemara will analyze the pasuk describing the halacha of the mitzri, and the Gemara will explain some of the words and phrases why they are needed. Then the Gemara will get into the details of a mitzri who's married to Israelis and how their halacha works, how you calculate the three generations of a mitzri. We'll get to a Mishnah, which introduces the halacha of the mamzer and then a sin. Then we'll have some drushes and sources in the dinim of the mamzer and the sin, and the explanation of the entire discussion as to how Nisinim became usher to marry a bekal. So the Gemara begins with the Brisa. The Brisa is discussing the Pasuk about the Mitzri. The Mitzri and the... also relevant to the Amini. So about the... Mitzri, the Torah says, lahem, lahem lahem. The Mitzri is not allowed to marry into Kaisel, even if they are Megayer. However, they are considered to be Dor Rishon. The convert, the Mitzri convert to Israel, is considered to be Dor Rishon. His child would be Dor Shani. The grandchild would be Dor Shlishi. That one is allowed to marry, as it says, lahem Dor Shlishi, lahem Hashem. So the Mitzri wants to know, why does it have to say Bunim? And Dor Shlishi. You talk about the Bonim, you talk about the Dor. You could talk about the third level that's born, and you could talk about the third generation. Why do you need those two words together? So the Gemara says they're both needed. If we would have just said the third son, you would have think that means his first son, second son, third son, all of which are his own sons. But that's not correct. It's not until a third generation that it's mutter. And if it would have only said generations, you would have said that we're counting generations from now, from Arsina. It has to say Banim to show that we're counting from him, from the Mitzri himself. Now, it also says the word Lahem twice. It's Shay Yivoldu Lahem, and Darshli Shay Yavo Lahem Bekal Hashem. So, what are the two Lahems for? So the Gemara says, Lehem is one is to show that we count from him, we count from the Mitzri himself, he's called a Dor Rishon. The other one is to show that if a Mitzri is married to a Yisrael, whether it's a female Mitzri and a male Yisrael, or a male Mitzri and a female Yisrael, either one we have to count, we consider the child to be a puzzle and cannot marry Bekahal. It's not until the grandchild that can marry Bekahal. If either parent is a psal, then there's a psal on the kid in this situation. Now, says the uh Gemara, <clears throat> why do you need to have Lahem and Asher Yivoldu? Asher Yivoldu seems like it's contradicting to Lahem. Asher Yivoldu seems to sound like you count from the child. Lahem sounds like you count from them. So what does that mean? So the Gemara says it means to say as follows. You count from them. They are the first generation. However, if you have a mitzris who is pregnant and she converts, the child that's born from her is one that was conceived while she was a mitzvah and born while she was a Yisraelis, that child counts as a convert, and therefore that child counts as Dar Rishon. That child's child will be Dar Shani, and it's not until that child's grandchild that they're allowed to be Bekal Hashem. That's why we say Asher Yivoldu that's born from them, that's born from the one who converted, is the one that counts as a second Dar, but the one who is already in the womb when she converted, that does not count as a second Dar. Now, the Gemara says, why do you have to say Lahem here to teach me that you count from either parent as apostle? And also in the Pasuk about Mamzer, it says, Yevolo Bekal Hashem. You have the word lo, that uh, you, that's the same limud in, in regards to the mamzer, that if either parent is a mamzer, the child is a mamzer. So why do you have to say the same halacha both by mitzvahs and by mamzer? So the question is you need them both, because either one could be viewed as being more chomer than the other. Uh, the mamzer is more chomer because the mamzer is their olam, they never have a heter, and therefore they might be more chomer than the mitzvahs. On the other hand, the mitzri is more chomer than the mamzer because the mitzri comes from a father who is Puzzle himself. However, the Mamzer comes from a regular Yisrael and Yisraelis. It's the relationship that creates the Mamzer, but because they come from a Kasher, you may think that they are lighter. Okay, now the Gemara goes into the Lachos of what happens when you have a marriage between a Mitzri uh, Shani and a Mitzris Rishona. Who do we consider, who do we go, Who? which parent do we follow when we're counting the Yichas? Do we follow the mother? Do we do we follow the father, or do we follow whichever one is stricter or lighter? So the Gemara has a few different versions of what Rav Yochanan said here. So Rabbi Baruchana quotes Rav Yochanan as having said that if you have a mitzri sheni who marries a mitzvah rishona, so if you follow the father, then the child of this marriage will be a shlishi and mutter lavo bekahal. If you follow the mother, the child will be a sheni and aser lavo bekahal. His child will be mutter lavo bekahal. So according to Rabbi Baruchana's version of Rav Yochanan, he said you follow. The father, the child's a shlishi, and able to come be kahal. 
So says the Gemara, we have some kashas on this. First one is of Yosef, who calls Rabbi Tarfin, who said that there's a way to be Metahar Mamzer. How could you be Metahar a Mamzer? A Mamzer is allowed to marry a Shifcha. If a Mamzer marries a Shifcha, the child that's born is a is an Evet, or a Shifcha herself, if she's a female. That child, if she's freed, if he or she is freed, becomes a regular Yisrael Kasher, not a Mamzer. Since she became a Shifcha, She's following her mother, he or she is following its mother, not the father, and getting the status of a shefcha and not a mamzer, and if she's free, then there's no mamzerus there. So you see, either way you see that the child follows the mother here, it's the ichas of the mother and not the ichas of the father. So that would be a kasha on Rav Yechonan here, according to Rabbi Bar who said that he followed the ichas of the father as far as determining which generation of Mitri will have over here. So the one says maybe this is different, it's special to the custom. In this situation, you follow the fa- you follow the mother, because the Torah says, that uh, Shevcha's child counts as an Eved. And that's where it says, uh, She and her children both belong to the master. Special halacha for Shevcha and Avad. Oh, there's another kasha that's asked by Rava. Rava quotes of Yehuda, who quoted, he said he had a friend, Minyamin, who was a Ger Mitzri. He was a Mitzri convert. He was a Dar Rishon. And he said he was a one of the Talmide Rabbi Akiva. And he said, I'm a Mitzri Rishon. He married another Mitzris, Rishona. They had a child who was a Mitzri Shani, and he said, I'm going to marry off my child to a Mitzris, Shnia, so that they could have a child who will be a Shlishi and Roy Lovey Bikahal. Um, that implies that had he married off his child to a Rishona, the child would be a Shani and Azul Lovey Bikahal, which means you follow the mother, not the father. So Yomar says, Akash and Yechanan. Yomar says, no, Rav Yechanan uh, amended that b'risa, and he said he could have married off his child, and I believe he did say that he's marrying off his child to Mrs. Rishona, and therefore the child would be able to be Lava Bekal, simply because his father, who was this Minyamin, was a, uh, he's the son of Minyamin, and therefore he would be, the child would be a Shlishi, following his father's Yichas. Oh, Okay, now the Gemara has a different version of Rav Yechonon. This is brought by Rav Dimi. He says that the case of a Mitzri Shani who marries a Mitzri Shona, the child is a Shani. You follow the mother. So you see that the Yechus follows the mother. So the Gemara says Abai had a kasha. It's a kasha from something else that Rav Yechonon said, talking about the child of a cow that was set aside to be a carbon chatos. Now, this kasha is based on the fact that we're understanding that the reason you would follow the Yichas of the Moses is because of a concept called Ur Yarach Imo. The fetus, while it's not born yet, is considered to be a limb of the mother, it's considered to be a part of the mother. Therefore, as far as Yichas goes, it'll always be considered to be following the Yichas of the mother, it's considered to be a limb of the mother while it's in utero, and when it's detached, it's still considered to be its own being now, but it's a limb of the mother and therefore follows the mother's Yichas. That's the more's understanding. If that's the case, the concept of Yubar Yerach Imo, that means that if for this halacha to be true, that you follow the Yichas of the mother, that means that while the child is in utero, while it's a fetus, it should be considered to be one unit with the mother, it should not be considered to be a separate creature. But we're going to show that it is considered to be a separate creature from this halacha of an animal that was set aside for a karmen chatas. Now, the halacha of the karmen chatas is that if a karmen chatas uh, gives birth, the uh, offspring of the set aside karmen chatas has to go. Limisa. However, if you have two Korbonos Chatas that are both set aside to give birth, you can use either one of them. And the one that you use, the other one goes, uh, it's called Yirasha Yistavu, the other one is left to graze until it dies or gets a mum. So, the Gemara has a quote of Rav Yechelen. Rav Yechelen says, if somebody sets aside a Korbon Chatas, an animal has a Chatas, and that animal is pregnant, and it gives birth. So the halacha here is that you can choose whichever one you want. You could use each one. That means it was considered to be that at the time that you were mafresh this carbon chatas, you set aside this animal to be a chatas, and it was pregnant, it's considered to be like you were mafresh both the mother and the fetus. That's why you can use either one to be a carbon chatas, because each one is considered to be a separate chatas. If you would have considered it to be the yerachima, that means at the time you were mafresh it is a limb of the mother, and then later the mother gives birth to it, then it would be considered a chatas that gave birth, and the child would have to go to Misa. So you see that uh, you have the um, concept of Uber, of Uber, 
Yerachimoyin does not apply because the fetus is considered to be separate entity from the mother at the time that you're mafreshid and is considered to be mafresh separately. So this is a kasha on this Rav Dimi's version of Yerachimoyin. This is what Abai asked. When Rav Dimi is quiet, he didn't answer. So Abai defended him. Abai said, I'll defend you. Because here it says Asher Yivoldu. Here it specifically says in this in defining the mitzri and the uh, mitzvah it goes by birth, and since it goes by the birth, it's not it has nothing to do with the erech imo. The reason that it has the yichas of the mother is not because it's erech imo. Really, a child is not erech imo. That's what uh, Rav Yechonon holds. But it says it goes by the birth, and that goes to the mother. The mother is the one who gives birth, and therefore it takes the mother's yichas. So Rav Dimi said, you're right, that's what Rav Yechelen said, but I saw you there by the shear. I saw you, I saw, he, called, he referred to him as a Chashem individual, he said Karkafta, which means there's a big head, it's a sign of Chashivas, and he said, I saw your head between the pillars of the Beis Medrash, I know you were there, you didn't make this up yourself, you knew that that's what Rav Yechelen had really said at the time. Okay, now the Gemara moves on, the Gemara makes a diuk, once you tell him that it's because it says Asher Yivoldu, that's why you follow the Yichas of the mother, that shows that in other situations, you would follow, generally, you would follow the Yichas of the father. Anything has the Yichas of the father. So the Gemara says, Rav has a kash on that. So that's if you have a Nachris who is pregnant and she's Megayer. So you're telling me that uh, she's considered to be a separate entity than the mother. You normally would follow the Yichas of the father. The child, the fetus, is a separate entity. It's not Yerach if that's the case, then the child should not be converted by the conversion of the mother. The child should be born and should require a separate conversion. However, we have a statement, um, a brisa perhaps, that says that the child does not need tefillah. The child doesn't have to go to the mikvah. It's considered to be a Jew already without having to go to the mikvah. So why? So according to what you're saying, that it's considered to be a separate entity from the mother, it should need its own tefillah. The tefillah of the mother is not a tefillah for the ubar. Sigmar so says, maybe the reason is because of Rabbi Yitzchak. Rabbi Yitzchak says that the only thing that's a chatzitza, that blocks a tefillah, midaraisa, is if it's covering rove, the majority of the body, and you're makbid, and you don't want it to be there. However, a fetus is not makbid on being inside its mother. It's very happy to be there, and we're happy that it is within. That's where it belongs. So therefore, deraisa should not be a chatzitza, and therefore it counts as a tefillah, deraisa, you shouldn't require anything else. The problem is, is that here it's not majority. That halacha, that makbid, it's only considered to be a chatzitza if you don't want the covering between the uh, whatever is doing tefillah and the water. That's only a problem if it's a makbid. That's only true if it's a majority covered. However, where it's kulai covered, it's totally covered, it's not a tefillah at all. And therefore, this shouldn't be considered to be tefillah, it should be considered to be a chatzitza. So, therefore, it should not be a good tefillah. So, that can't be an explanation as to why this tefillah counts. And therefore, we still have to assume that the reason is because ubri yorachimo, it's still the kash on you. So, he says, no, the answer is, is that here, it's not just uh, ain't a makbid. It's something stronger than that. It's revise. This is where the fetus belongs. This is its natural state. Its natural state is within the mother. Therefore, even though it's considered to be a separate entity, the tefillah of the mother works in the sana chatzitza at all. Okay, now the Gemara goes further and quotes Ravina, who quotes Rav Yechanan, who says two statements about Yichus of an Akam, Yichus of the Goy. And the Gemara will explain each one. So Rav Yechanan says, according to this, that it depends if you're talking about is Yichus as far as being a Goy or is Yichus after it converts. So Rav Yechanan says as follows. Well, if they're not converted, then the Yichus follows the father. Um, once they do convert, then the Yichus follows whichever one is a bigger Pugum, whichever one is a bigger blemish, that's where the yichas follows. So the Gemara explains what this means. Before they convert, what's the difference who the yichas is? The difference is if they count this being from the Shiva Amim, from the seven nations of Canaan or not. The Allah is, is that on the seven nations of Canaan, you're not allowed to take them as an Evid. It's Lo Yisachai Kol Neshama. None of them can be left alive. The other nations of the world can be taken as a Vodim. So the question is, if you have a child that's born from a mother and a father, one of which is from the seven Umos, and is has the rule of those Sakai Neshama, and the other parent is from the Umos, can you take them as an Eved, or do they have to be not left alive, those Sakai Kol Neshama? So there he says, you follow the father. If the father is from the from the Zion Umos, then it's those Sakai Kol Neshama. If the father is from the other Nations of the world can be taken as an Eved. Where do you get that from? So says that's learned out of the Pasuk describing it. It says, From the dweller, from those that dwell with you, mehem tiknu. You can purchase from them. They can be in Eved. 
those that give birth in your land, they can stay, uh, they can be an inheritance to you. So the Gemara says, we understand this to mean as follows. We're talking about a stranger who comes from a different land, a man comes from somewhere else, and he comes, and he marries a local from the Zion Umos, and he has a child. There, That's the one the Pasuk is referring to when it says that you're allowed to um, purchase them as an Eved, you're allowed to take them as an Eved. And the reason is because the wife usually stays where she grew up. The, the husband travels. If we have a marriage between two umos, the place that they're living will be the place of the mother. So here you have where it's Hatoshavim, Agarim Yamachem, coming from somewhere else. And it says, They're giving birth here, so they're coming from somewhere else to give birth here. This is the mother's land, and therefore it's the father that's coming from the other umos. And that's where we're saying that they're permitted to be Avadim and not uh, have to be Lazachaya Kal and Shama. The opposite, though, there we would apply the rule that it's considered to be, there if they have the man coming from the Zion Umos and going somewhere else, there we would apply the rule that you follow the father. Again, again, you're following the father and they would, uh, that's the Pasuk that says that they're going and they're giving birth somewhere else. That's referring to that case where the father's from the Zion Umos and there it would be the Sechaya Kol Neshama. So that's Rehman's first halacha. Rehman's second halacha, which we saw, was that after they convert, you follow the Pogum Shebohem. So Mar says, what does this mean? You're talking about a case where you have two converts, that are married to each other, and you're following Pogum Shem. That means they both have a Pagam, and it makes a difference which one you follow. So what are we talking about? We can't be talking about... So obviously we're we're referring to two different Umos, because we're saying you follow the Pogum Shem Bahem, two different Umos. And what are these two Umos? So let's assume one's a Mitzri and one's an Amoidi, the Gemara says. If the father's a Mitzri and the mother's an Amoinis, then you can't apply this, because you can't say they're both Pogum, and you follow the one which was more of a Pagam, because the mother's not Pogum at all. The mother is in Amoinis, and we know Amoini Vilei Amoinis, she's totally Mutter. So you got to be referring to where the father is in Amoini and the mother is in Mitzvah. Now it makes a big difference who you follow, and it depends if the child is a male or a female. If the child is a Zachar, so being that he's a Zachar, if you would have a Din Amoini following his father, then he would be Aser Lo'ilam, his descendants forever. All generations would apply there, so there's no Hector of the third generation. If it would be a Mitzri, then his kids would be a mutter because he would have a den of a Mitzri Shani. So there the Allah has you follow the Pagam Shabbat, the bigger Pagam is being an Amoini for this male child, and therefore you follow the the uh, father, he's an Amoini, and he's also is Oilam. However, if it's a female, so a female, if she would be considered an Amoinis, she'd be mutter entirely, because Amoini will be like Amoinis. If she would be considered to be a Mitzris, then she would be also now, but at least she would be mutter after the third dar. But that's more chamer. That's the bigger pagam. So, therefore, it comes out in this case. We have an amayni who marries a mitzvah. If the child is a zachar, you follow the father, and he has a din amayni. If the child is in a cave, you follow the mother, and she has a din mitzvah, and she's also at least now, and then her kids would be mutter afterwards. This concludes the Gemara's comment on this mission. Now we'll begin the next mission, a one-line mission that discusses a mamzer and a nisin. Now, Mamzer, we know, is a child that's born from an Kares. Nisin is one of the Gevoinim, one of a special nation that was one of the Zion Umis, who were not supposed to be allowed to convert. However, they uh, disguised themselves and they were permitted to convert. And after they converted, their uh, deception was discovered, but they weren't killed. They were allowed to stay and they became water carriers and wood choppers. And they were eventually asked for anybody to marry them by the basin of David HaMelech. The Gemara will explain how that happened. So the mission says as follows. A mamzer and a nisin are usher forever. There is no heter after any number of generations. Also, a mamzer and a sin, both males and females, have the iser. There is no heter for the females. There's no, um, it's not, not like an amini, a minus, you don't have that. So they have both problems. They have forever iser and males and females. So the Gemara begins, Rish Lakir says that a mamzeres is permitted after 10 generations. Where do you get this from? So the Gemara says, there is a standing heckish, Xavier Shava, between uh, Mamzer and Amoini and Mayavi. What's that? As far as Mamzer is concerned, it just says 10th generation. It doesn't say La'ilam. It's only about Amoini and um, Ma'avi that it says, it says 10th generation and it says the Oilam. 
So that's where we learn that when it says tenth generation, by Amoni and Avi, it means Lail, it means forever. Tenth generation is Lav Dafka. We learn from there that Amamta is also tenth generation is forever. So it says Rish Lakish, but once that Hekish is set up, once the connection is set up, we could also learn from Amoni and Avi that females are permitted, and therefore a female Mamzeres is permitted. It says the Gemara, so then she should be permitted right away. Why is it only after ten generations? So the Gemara says it's only after ten generations because the entire Hekish is only in the 10th generation and on. That's where the Hekish exists. You learn from Amoni and Amoni that the Isser Lo'olam applies forever after generation number 10. So there, you take the Halacha of Amoni and Amoni and it's Amoni's Veloi, it's Amoni Veloi Amoni's, Amoni Veloi Amoni's, and therefore Mamzeris is permitted, but only from 10th generation. That's where we get the Halacha, Mamzeris from generation after 10th generation is permitted. So this Gemara, we have Akasha, our Mishnah didn't say so. Our Mishnah said that Mamzerim and Nisinim are Usr forever, and males and females. When we have a standing Zeru Shava or a standing Hekish, we know that there is a Machlekes. Do you only apply it in the specific place it was used, or do you apply it all over to all Halachos? It's a Machlekes called Dun Mina Umina or Dun Mina Vuki Baasa. You have to limit it to its specific zone, and you expand it to other areas. Okay, the Gemara goes on and says that they asked Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Eliezer, what's the lach of a mamzeres after ten generations? And he said, you wish you're going to find a mamzer or a mamzeres after three generations. If you would find one, I'd be metire him. Because it's not possible that he's a mamzer at all. So the Gemara says he obviously holds that a mamzer can't live... Mamzerim don't have generations that extend. The Gemara says, Rahuna said that as well. Mamzerim don't produce generations. They're short-lived by definition. And that's obviously in order that Klaisrael shouldn't marry into them. It says where we have a Mishnah, though, that says Mamzerim are Surin and the Isser is Isser forever. So Hagitab is an Isser forever if they can't go past third generations. So the Gemara says, Rabbi Zeyra said, it was explained to me, from Rabbi Huda that it depends if people know that he's a mamzer or not. If people know, we can live, no problem, because nobody's going to marry into their family. If no one knows, they're going to die right away, because people will marry into their family. If some people know and some don't, if someone knows and someone not, they'll live to the third generation. After the third generation, it becomes problematic, people will forget, and therefore they don't live past the third generations. Okay, says the Gemara, there was someone in the neighborhood of Rabbi Ami, who was a mamzer, and people didn't know about it, and Rav Ami was machers, he told everybody. So that mamzer was very upset, he was crying, and going, the Gemara says. So Rav Ami said to him, I'm giving you life. I'm giving you life, if you would be a mamzer, then no one knows you would die. I'm Pashat granting you the ability to live by publicizing that you are a mamzer. Okay, now the Gemara goes to the topic of how the Isra on Nisinim began. So the Gemara says, Rav Chana Barada says, David Hamach was Geyser on Nisinim. So the Gemara brings the uh, story. It says, "Avikar Hamach la'Gevonim v'Yemar Lehim la'Gevonim Lembi Bnei Yisrael Hema." He called the uh, Gevonim and he said to them, "And they are not from Bnei Yisrael." So why did he make a gzera on them at all? So the Gemara says, it says as follows. It says there was a hunger, it was a famine in the days of David Hamelach for three years. The first year, he said, maybe the reason is because Klai Yisrael being Oved of a and it says, mm-hmm. Like we say, that famine and hunger is brought by Abay Dazar. So the word says they checked and they found nobody was being levied Abay Dazar. So the second year he said, maybe it's because of people who are doing Arias, other Averis, like it says, That someone who's uh, behaving like an Isha is going to lose the right to reign and to sustenance. So the Gemara says, so they checked, and they found that there was no such thing. It was not correct. So the third year, he said, maybe the reason is because it's people who promise to give tzedakah for Rabbim, and they don't give. And, and that stops the rain, like it says, Nesim v'roch v'geshem ein ish m'sal b'matas sheker. People promise that they're going to give, and they praise themselves, and therefore there's no ruach v'geshem. So the says, they checked, and they found that there's no such thing. So, Dovod HaMelech said, Eina Dovod HaTola I have to do something about this. And he wanted to figure out what's the cause. So it says he asked Hashem. What did he do? Rishlaki says he asked the Urim Vetumim. How do you know that's Urim Vetumim? So it says it says Vayavakish as Pnei Hashem. The word Pnei, and uh, it tells elsewhere that Pnei refers to Urim Vetumim. Like it says Vashalei B'Mishpat Urim Lifnei Hashem. So Urim is referring to Pnei Hashem. 
what Hashem answer? So the pasuk quoted by the Gemara is that he said, "Ve'yemar Hashem el Shaul ve'el Beis Hadamim Asher Hemes Hagavanim." This is because of two things: because of Shaul and because of the Beis Hadamim that uh, Shaul killed out the Givonim. So El Shaul means that he didn't receive a proper hesped; he wasn't eulogized the way he should when he was killed in war. And then on the bloodiness of the house of blood that he killed the uh, Givonim. Gemara says, "When did Shaul kill the Givonim?" Gemara says, "He didn't kill the Givonim; he killed Novira Kehanim, the Nov city of Kehanim. They used to feed the Givonim because they would give the water and the wood for the Mizbeach, and therefore they paid them, and that's what they survived. And because the uh, Novar Kahanim were killed, the Givonim themselves had no support and they died. So, Marcus is a fascinating thing. We're praising Shaul's honor, we're claiming Shaul's honor, and criticizing him at the same time. We're saying because he didn't le- receive a proper hesped, at the same time that we're saying that he's being taken to task for having killed out the Givonim. So, Marcus says, Rishlakish. Rishlakish says, Yeah, that's how things happen. It says, Bakshu is Hashem, Kol, Anve, Aras, Hashem, Mishbato, Palu, Hashem, Mishbato, Sham, Palu. That where a person is judged, that's where his actions are. We talk about his praise and his criticism at the same time. So what did David HaMelech do now that he got his answer? So it's a lengthy story that follows. Gemara will pick it up later. As part of that, he ended up banning the Givonim. So let's just read that part. So it says that show that... David said, for Shaul, there's nothing to do at this point. It's more than 12 months after he died. We're not going to eulogize him now. That would be a chutzpah. As far as the uh, fact that the Givonim are upset, he called the king of the Givonim and said, what should I do for you? How can I be mechaper for this thing that happened many years ago to prevent this famine? So the king of the Givonim said, I don't want money, I don't want silver, I don't want gold. I want seven people from the descendants of Shaul. You should give me, and I'll hang them, Barabim. So, David Amalek tried to appease him with some other way, that he shouldn't insist on this terrible decree, and he he refused. So, David Amalek said, there are three simonim of Klai Yisrael, there are Achmanim, Baishanim, and Gomle Chasadim. Obviously, Givonim are not any of them, and therefore they are not part of Klai Yisrael, and no one should marry into them.